Uh, welcome everyone to the annual William Anthony Conservation Lecture for 2023. I'm so glad you all are here. I'm going to stay behind the podium for the benefit of the camera and our virtual uh, guests. Um, so pardon me if I, I usually like to get out there, but I'm going to stick, stay in place. Um, welcome again and um, to our esteemed guest, Yasmin Khan. We are very pleased to have you all here tonight in person and in the virtual world. Thank you for coming. I have to say it's been an, a, just a, an absolute joy to spend the afternoon with Yasmin today. And um, I hope I, I know that her joy will also um, be in this entire room in a few minutes. Um, I'm Giselle Simone. I'm the University Conservator at the University of Iowa Libraries and the Director of Conservation and Collections Care. Before we begin, I would like to extend my gratitude and respect to the Iowa, Meskwaki, and Sauk Nations, and all other Indigenous peoples who have inhabited this place. I acknowledge that this campus is situated on their homelands. Thank you. For those of you tuning in to the webinar, Beth Stone, our collections conservator, will be manning the online chat. If you have questions for Yasmin, please type them into the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can after the lecture. Closed ca captioning has been enabled. The William Anthony Conservation Lecture Series, hosted by the University of Iowa Libraries Conservation and Collections Care Department, um, invites book and paper conservators and bookbinders to share their experience and work in the UI Book Arts community and beyond. This series is made possible by a generous gift that established the William Anthony Fund in 1989, and it honors our very first library conservator and first bookbinding instructor at the University of Iowa Center for the Book. We are very grateful to our benefactors and friends, James Fluck and Julie Scott. To those who have assisted with this event, thank you. I am in your debt. Sarah Pinkham, Suzanne Glamo, Beth Stone, Chris Clark, Ann Bassett, Natalie Dawson, Paul Soderdahl, Associate University Librarian and my boss, and John Colshaw, the Jack B. King University Librarian. At the University of Iowa Center for the Book, Julie Leonard, the director, my co-host and dear colleague, for this annual event. In conjunction with this lecture, Yasmin will be teaching a workshop for the UICB students and conservation staff with funds provided by the Nadia Sophie Sealer Fund. Thank you to Kat Tandy, Craig Kelchin, for your help with the workshop. And also thanks to Nick Cladis, Tim Barrett, and Melissa Morton. It is my pleasure to introduce Suzanne Glamo our Collections Care Assistant at the University of Iowa Libraries. Suzanne hails from our very own UICB Endless programs. She holds an MFA and MA respectively, a bookbinder and an artist. She is also trained in book conservation and library preservation. Please welcome Suzanne. Thank you, Giselle. Good evening, everyone. A few weeks ago, I Zoomed with Yasmin Khan to chat with her about her work, her path into conservation, and her last visit to Iowa City in 2017, almost exactly six years ago. We covered a lot during that call, and I enjoyed learning a bit more about her background and career, as I'm sure you all will this evening as well. When you meet someone who is at the top of their field, it can be easy to imagine that they've always been there. They materialized out of the ether one sunny day and into a well-established conservation lab somewhere, favorite micro spatula in hand, and have been there ever since. As one of the early career folks in this room tonight, I find conversations like the one I shared with Yasmin precious because they remind me of two, well, really three things. One, that's not how careers actually happen. Two, each person has a distinct path that informs and shapes their careers. And three, these paths take time. While we chatted, 
Yasmin shared with me that it wasn't always clear to her that she'd work in conservation. She came up from the study of language and of Islamic illustrated, sorry, Islamic illuminated manuscripts. These are objects that still speak to her most closely today as they are embedded in a culture and in places that are familiar to her, indeed a culture and places from which she originates, Pakistan and the broader landscape of Islamicate book crafts and production. I got to ask Yasmin if she had any advice for book practitioners in training. Thoughtfully, she responded that folks should take every opportunity to practice and apply. She said, and I'll quote her here, it's better to have other people say no to you than to say no to yourself. It's a small world and book and paper. Even if you don't think you're fully qualified for the job yet, you should apply. The more you interview, the better you get at it, the more you learn and know about yourself. It's a chance to show your works and to meet folks in this small enough community. This advice has stayed with me because I don't think it's the kind of advice you offer unless you trust both in the promise of the folks coming into the field and in the quality of the community on the other side of the application process. So thank you again, Yasmin, for the advice. In returning to Iowa City, Yasmin shared with me that she is especially looking forward to giving her 15th century Turkish binding workshop to a much smaller group than she did last time. For those of you who don't know, her 2017 University of Iowa Mellon Sawyer class, in which she taught 30 scholars and bookbinders of widely different skill levels all together for eight hours, apparently takes the cake for the most out there book and teaching experience she has ever had. She hasn't taught since before the pandemic and shared that as with any other craft, she's excited to revive that muscle memory, something many of us who work with our hands and with books can relate to, I think. Not unlike binding a book, a career takes time. Shared events, community events like tonight's lecture are some of those moments that mark the passage of time. Thank you to all of you attending this evening for sharing your time with us tonight. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight's 2023 University of Iowa Anthony Lecturer in Conservation. Yasmin Khan has worked in conservation since 1987. Originally from Pakistan, she came to the United States to study earning a Bachelor of Arts from Barnard College of Columbia University and a Master of Library and Information Science with a certificate in the conservation of library and archival materials from the University of Texas. She is presently the head of paper conservation section at the Library of Congress, where she has worked in several conservation roles since 1996. A book conservator, we have confirmed this, she has treated paper and parchment manuscripts and books from various cultures and periods. Her research has been and continues to be focused on the characterization of bookmaking and its associated crafts in the Middle East and South Asia, and the development of techniques for the preservation of illuminated manuscripts from the same geographic areas. She has taught and consulted on these subjects in the US, Europe, and Asia. Her publications, some co-authored, include Technical Studies of Early Arabic Parchment Leaves and Armenian Bindings, Research into Treatment Development for Iron Gall Ink, and the Evolution of Conservation Practice in the U.S. Welcome, Yasmin. Thank you. Suzanne, that was, it's really hard to follow up on that. Um, thank you for asking me to speak at this lecture series. I feel honored to be included in a roster that has included friends and colleagues, such as Pam Spitzmuller, Gary Frost, Adam Larson, Maria Fredericks, Deborah Howe, Barbara Corbell, Mark Essen, Peter. Bahian. Um, many people I studied with were trained by Bill Anthony, and um, 
So my so his name has been familiar to me throughout my career in the US. Um, oh, she or he studied with Bill Anthony was kind of, you know, meant that you were conservation royalty. So um, um, I'm, I'm really glad to be here and I feel a little overwhelmed. But um, this talk, I asked Suzanne what I should talk about and, and, um, and she said um, that, she, you know, it'd be kind of interesting to know who I was and where I came from. So um, she mentioned, you know, conservators don't just magically appear. They're, they're created. So I'm going to give you my creation story. Um, let's see. Is this? So laying the foundation. Um, these are my parents, the Khans. Um, and they, my father was a diplomat um, for the uh, government of Pakistan. And, um, you know, he had started in the diplomatic service um, when Pakistan was created. He was already an Indian civil servant. And so when the country, country split up because his parents lived in Pakistan, he became a Pakistani diplomat. And this is them in their house in Spain, which is where I was born when they were living in that house. And um, you may notice that there's a lot of bric-a-brac around. My father was a big collector of antiques and he went through different periods, chinoiserie, you know, the awful furniture, good carpets, but he always collected books and um, paintings and um, Indian paintings as well. So um, we lived in many different countries. Um, that, that person with the round circle around them is me. Um, this is us in Nepal. Um, with my parents, I traveled to, I was born in Spain. We moved to Nigeria after that. After that, we moved to India. And when we were in India, there was a war between India and Pakistan. So we were in India at the time. Then we moved to Nepal. And then we moved to Libya. And after that, Sri Lanka, Sweden, and Denmark, which is when I jumped ship. Um, so just to point out, um, that's my brother. I was the youngest of five children. I had two elder sisters, then a brother, and then this, my brother, and then this sister and me. Um, that's my sister Fosia, closest to me in age, a nuclear physicist. This is my eldest sister, who is 10 years older than me, um, who started out studying to be an artist, and my father was really, really proud of her. And then um, after one year of art school, she decided she liked anatomy so much, she became she went back to school to study to be a doctor, and that was really disappointing for my father, <laughs> literally. <laughs> you can tell the bric-a-brac -brac really got to him. So after I jumped ship, I um, came to the U.S. I was the first of my siblings to come to the U.S. because I wanted to get far away from my family, uh, being the youngest of um, five siblings and the parents, too much attention. Um, so I went to I came for a year of high school in the US and then I decided to stay on and went to Barnard. And it was at Barnard that I, my parents were heavily, we were very academically focused family, um, though my father had really wanted my sister to become an artist, but everybody rebelled, all the kids rebelled and became super academic. Um, so, um, so I went to college and I started on various, I decided to study philosophy first, then I decided to study religion, then I moved to history, Asian history, um, and then I decided to study art history, but I really focused on Middle Eastern art and um, South Asian art because I had the language skills, because I was also studying languages at the, that point. Um, and these women were all really um, seminal in moving me um, into finally considering conservation. Barbara Miller, 
Barbara Stoller Miller was the great Sanskritist um, and uh, translator of the Gita Govinda, the love song of the Dark Lord, which is a very standard Hindu text. Um, so she was my advisor and she um, got me all kinds of jobs. Um, we were living in New York, so I got to work at a, with an art dealer. I got to work with all kinds of people. Um, and then Mimi Lukens Switokowski was one of my professors, but she was also a curator at the Met. And I ended up becoming her research assistant. And I really hated working in curatorial work. Oh, it was just awful. Um, at that time, it was a very um, ivory tower thing. There was a lot of internecine warfare between curators and the poor research assistant would always get involved. I'd go into my desk and somebody would have taken everything and hidden it. So I would have to spend half a day looking for my stuff. And I just decided um, that wasn't for me. Um, the uh, working for the art dealer was very problematic because though the dealer was very reputable, um, she was basically dishonest. Um, dealing with antiquities from Asia and South Asia, there's very it's very hard to be honest, to be truly true. And, you know, um, but what really bothered me was that um, when the sculpture that sculpture that she would get when pieces were missing, she would have her, um, you know, she'd hire somebody and they would scoop out the inside of the um, sculpture and create with epoxy, create the missing bits. So that was a little bit um, rough. Anyway, it, the, long story short, she ended up in jail. But, but way way after I left, by the way, way after I left. Um, but, you know, um, since, you know, I'm chatting and gossiping as it were, um, the, uh, she would come to Pakistan on shopping trips. I was never allowed to, even if I was there, I was never allowed to be with her on these. And she would pay the, the people she'd buy from at her, um, when the items arrived, at her doorstep in New York City. Only then would she pay them. So her hands were barely clean, but they were clean. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Mimi, um, you know, I expressed to Mimi how I didn't want to work for a dealer. I didn't want to work for a curator. Um, and I didn't want to teach art history. So what should I do? And she said, well, go down to the conservation lab. And there's a conservator there. She's just recently been to Pakistan. She'll show you around. And that was Margaret um, Peggy Holborn Ellis. And she had just come back from Pakistan. Um, she had gone to review, go back. She'd gone to check up on the um, artists, artisans that Dard Hunter had interviewed for his book in 1939 on hand paper making in um, India. So, you know, partition, those paper makers, makers ended up in Pakistan. So she went to see, um, meet them. Um, most of them were now involved in either making um, sports goods or uh, uh, what is, what's the other thing? Um, yes, surgery, surgical equipment. That's what that city is now really famous for. Um, however, she was very kind and um, told me how to become a conservator. And what I heard was, um, I'm sure it was more complex, but what I heard was you need to take chemistry and you need to do studio arts. So I immediately enrolled in the chemistry class at Columbia, which was the hardest chemistry class because it was meant to get rid of all the pre-meds, so I bombed terribly. And um, I uh, took figure drawing and then later took printmaking with um, a, a, a very famous printmaker now, Bob Blackburn, who run, ran the printmaking studio in New York City. And that's kind of interesting because now we have a, um, a, a postgraduate fellow in the conservation division who is doing her research on Bob Blackburn's printmaking studio and his techniques. So it's interesting, things keep coming around. 
But what I finally realized was that I could not um, ever go to graduate school in the U.S. because there was no money for me. I was a Pakistani. I didn't have, um, um, I couldn't get any scholarship money and I was unwilling to ask my parents to pay for it. Um, So this lady, Anna Marie Schimmel, um, who's a Harvard professor, but at the a guest curator at the Met at the time. Um, and so she said to me, well, Yasmin, you just, and, and Anna Marie Schimmel was a, um, a specialist in Urdu poetry from Pakistan and, and from India and mystical poetry. She said, well, just, you know, the Germans, she, she was German. Um, we'll give you money. They'll give you money. Um, you know, they're doing lots of work in Germany. Just, you know, so I said, all right. So I also started studying German. So this all happened around the beginning of my junior year, well, the second semester of my junior year. My first semester, I was in Egypt. Um, and that didn't go well, but uh, we can avoid that. Uh, so I ended up finishing school and um, college. And then the only job I was offered in New York that came with a work permit was working for an advertising agency which I absolutely didn't want to do so I went to Pakistan and started working for the Institute of Folk Heritage in Islamabad which is where my parents lived and um and I started work and they gave me work as a researcher in crafts um living crafts so one of my um first jobs which I loved was working was going to this mosque, which is in Lahore. It's the biggest mosque in South Asia. And um, uh, documenting, working with the artisans who do this kind of Pietra Dura work, pilasters, um, that were, they were doing the restoration on this building. And so talking to them about their craft, writing it down, documenting it, and then um, creating a report that would then be filed at the Institute of Folk Heritage. So um, I, you know, realized that I re- I really didn't want to stay in Pakistan for much longer. So my um, boyfriend from college, who was living in Spain at the time, decided um, he he would, you know, he wanted to marry me. And so we he came over and we got married. And this is, yes, this is the wedding picture. And yes, he wore a turban. Um, Bob's name is Robert Stone Um, and uh, after we got married we went to live in Spain so I did not get permanent residency in the US I still couldn't come back to study Um, but while I was in um, um, while I was in Pakistan before I left I wrote to the German uh, government through the foreign set, but through the, I sent a letter to the Ministry of Culture and sent it to the German embassy saying, you're um, giving so much money to Pakistanis, offering scholarships to go and become engineers, but what about cultural heritage? You need to have some conservators as well. And Anna Marie Schimmel very kindly wrote me a letter to go with it, as did Barbara Miller, as did um, Mimi Swetachowski. So I'm living in Spain, um, doing teaching English, because that's what you did there. If you knew English in the 1980s, you taught English. Um, And um, I get a telephone call, and it's from the German foreign ministry and saying, we've got a scholarship for you. You can come and study conservation. Um, So this goes back to making opportunities for oneself. I had... um, there was something I wanted to do. Nobody was willing to give me, um, unless I wanted to go out and get it, there was no way I was going to, going to opportunities weren't going to appear. Um, so for four, six months, I was at the Bayerische Staatsbibliothek, which was in um, Munich. And I studied with Helmut Banzer, Barbara Fischer, and Monica Gast. And then the next six months, I was in Berlin, where I studied with Ernst Bartelt, Angelica Fechner, and Patricia Engel. Patricia Engel now um, heads a program in Austria. Um, so Barbara Fischer was a lovely, lovely conservator who had um, 
who had who was very much involved with she was interested in the in um, the evidential value of a book and its place in its culture and she um, really what she her point of view really informed what I had learned at working at the Institute of Folk Heritage and um, made you know I still took my own culture very much for granted but it sort of helped a little bit with um, looking at things a little bit from the outside I had no experience bookbinding I had never stuck two pieces of paper together I had only take taken drawing um, studio drawing and um, printmaking I knew nothing so when I was brought to her she said um, she asked me about my credentials and I said well you know this um, I've been to college and I took you know these three classes and she said can you go into my office for a minute and I went into the office and she went out in the hall and I heard her scream really loudly and then um, she came back in and she was one of the best teachers I've ever had um, and now looking back on it there is no way I would ever take anybody with my level of um, training into a conservation lab that was but the the difference was in Germany um, because of the unionization and the legal um, regulations there because I was a foreigner I could not work on anything that belonged to the institutions so I had to um, I was told that beforehand thank goodness my father was a big collector so I basically brought his collection with me to work on in Germany because that's the only way I could learn anything. So this was the first book I ever bound. And um, this is sort of interesting for you, Tim. The, the end papers are, so all of this was the, the, the uh, um, paste down is from an old book, Greek book, and the end leaves are um, reused. And they're from, uh, they're a type of um, leaf that was sized with rye flour. Um, which she said was something that was done in 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 Germany or at the time in the 17 1800s but um, after that I had to go back to Pakistan to um, because the government I had uh, you know um, written an agreement with the Germans that I would go back to Pakistan and work for the Pakistani government but they were completely uninterested in me so I went back to working for the Institute of Folk Heritage because the, um, the conservators, the conservation community there was, um, I was too threatening to them because I was more, had a better, I was more educated than what they felt, you know, conservators there basically had to do um, 12th grade and and they didn't want me in the labs giving people ideas. So. Um, so the Iraq war happened, the first one, and suddenly um, my husband was told he had to leave Pakistan and he said, I'm not going without my wife. And so within a week, I got a green card and we ended up in Austin so that he could go back to graduate school. And I um, went to the Harry Ransom Center and talked to Jim Stroud and he said, well, you can volunteer. And after volunteering for six months, twice a week, um, they offered me a job, and I had the pleasure of working with all these people. Um, Jim Stroud, Olivia Primanis, Sue Murphy, Karen Pavelka. And um, this was the first time I only worked on Western material. Up to that point, I had only treated Islamic material, miniature paintings, illuminated manuscripts, Unfortunately, all my I couldn't find any of my slides, so I can't show you the. I was hired as a paper conservator, worked on Burne Jones, Rossetti's, all kinds of really fantastic things, and um, and then the conservation program opened, and I was in the first class. Paul Banks and Carolyn Harris um, accepted me, and. Here, a son of, um, you know, Gary was one of my instructors and 
in my last year, Karen Pavelka, who was had been my boss at the HR Harry Ransom Center, was now teaching um, paper conservation, as was Olivia Primanis, and um, and you know it was it was act it was a very good um, program and gave me a lot of flexibility, which resulted in um, my going to the Library of Congress after my internship. I did an internship at the Smithsonian and then um, I was offered a job at the Library of Congress. Um, the subtext of um, this presentation is that, you know, how one goes from being object focused to people focused. And that's pretty much been the trajectory of my um, career. It's learning to pivot and why one needs to pivot and how that's what the dividends are from that from that change um you know my um upbringing my parents moved ever, ever, ever so often so i wasn't invested in people um because i changed home, homes every two years so i was really books were the one thing that were immutable and didn't change and you could be in Libya and you could read that book, Lord of the Rings, or you could be in um, Stockholm and read the same book and there wasn't going to be much change. And um, so that's, so I was really object focused. And I continued to be that way for many, many, many years. The initial training, of course, at the Harry Ransom Center and even at the Library of Congress, um, I was, you know, how many treatments could I get underneath under my belt? That was kind of um, the focus. So at the library, conservation isn't in the beautiful building. It's in the dull building, okay. otherwise known as the Madison. And um, this is the book conservation lab um, on one side, um, on the left, and the paper conservation lab on the right. I started off in book conservation for six weeks. Then I moved into paper conservation for three years. Then I moved into book conservation for many, many years. And for the past several years, I have been in the paper conservation lab, which is why um, to define myself as a book conservator, whether I'm a book conservator or not is really on your perception of me. However, my perception of me is that I'm a book conservator, but different people have different points of view, and all of them are valid. Um, so the Library of Congress Conservation Lab has been around for the past 40 years, and, um, you know, it was really state of the art when it started and um, needs a wee bit of an overhaul right now. Um, coming to the library one of the reasons I came to the library was Sylvia Albro. Um, she was some, I was doing a research project when I was a, an, a graduate student and came across her work. And when I went to Washington, D.C. for my internship, she um, helped me with that research and was is absolutely a star in the field of conservation. And um, she's retired now but I still see her fairly often. And Holly Kruger was my, first, um, was my first boss in the paper lab. And both of these have been very, very influential in um, what I've learned and how I present myself. Um, though Sylvia's husband was Tom Albro was my boss in the book lab, great guy too, but I don't have a picture. Um, so, I decided not to focus on Islamic bindings um, for this talk because um, there's already one online um, at the Mellon Sawyer lecture that I gave that had a lot of Islamic binding because there are many, many other things I've worked on that have been really significant to, for me. But I decided to present one because um, one thing about working in an institution is every treatment just lingers. Even when you finish it, it goes back into the division. You always want to go and look at it. Is it, is it 
is it has it worked out well? Would I redo it? Um, and that's kind of it's it's lovely to be able to go back to one's uh, to the evidence of one's mistakes. Um, <laughs> you learn a lot from that too. So this is um, a 16th century manuscript, the Ajaybe Makhlukat. Um, while these are the um, pasteboards made up of um, a variety of uh, um, practice sheets, calligraphy sheets, um, which we decided not to take apart, but we also decided not to use the cover. Um, this is what the text block looked like, um, heavily uh, mended over the years. Um, as you can see, um, and with Islamic manuscripts, more so perhaps than others, there's always a, a campaign of various campaigns of restoration that have occurred in the past because in the Muslim world, um, books were kept because they were manuscripts and not printed. They were kept in circulation for much longer than maybe a printed book would have been in the West. So, um, so this book is actually uh, an encyclopedia of the um, wonders of creation, is what it's called. Um, and so after I took off the old men's and leaf cast paper to um, create um, new men's and extend the sheets the way they were, um, various interns in the paper lab took off old men's on, we used, we Get, had them practice to take off old men's and fill in, um, do loss compensation. Um, so it was a teaching tool that I worked with them on, and then I did the um, final treatment. Um, so, you know, Japanese paper didn't have, have the opacity to do these men's, um, and Western paper was too thick and too rattly for these men. So I had to create, make something that was soft enough that I could then um, size to the degree that it would have the feel of the, of the very soft older paper. And even now we, um, in the conservation lab at the library, for many, um, Arab papers and Persian papers, we actually leaf cast the paper for the fills. Um, and that's the final binding. And here you can see that this book had um, two types of paper. This is the front of the book. So this is the old paper that's very, very soft. And at this point right here, somebody rewrote in the 17th century or 18th century, rewrote this part of the book on Western paper that has the um, Treloon watermark. Um, and you can see that, that when they um, took the saw to um, trim the book, um, it, the, the qualities of the two paper are very clearly distinct. And that's me proudly showing the book after it's been bound. Um, so this is a book that has uh, Peter Waters in the 19... Uh, early 90s had this book disbound. Um, it's a uh, Haggadah from 1478 that was um, illustrated, written and illuminated by Joel Ben Simeon, who grew up in Frankfurt, one of the few medieval um, Jewish artists who, who we know their name, his name, and we know a little bit about the trajectory of his life. Um, so the book had been bound in a 19th century binding and trimmed. And so the pages were all awry. Um, it had been rebound in the late 90s in a, um, a leather binding with clasps, but that was really um, causing some damage to the book. So um, it came back and I um, treated it again and rebound it. So the this is the... Um, it's an alum toward binding with an alum toward hinge. And in, I took off the paper, the, the vellum end sheets from the late 90s or early 2000s and put paper sheets, paper end sheets, because the new vellum was really fighting the old vellum, which was kind of super thin and heavily damaged. Um, 
there was a dropout of the iron gall ink. So it had been treated in the, uh, in the 2000s with um, gelatin on fish skin, but even that was being attacked, you know, falling apart um, because the ink was, the copper in the ink was um, diluting the um, adhesive. Oops, I'm going really slow. Um, so anyway, this is, this is what it looked like. Um, I strongly suggest um, looking at this online. It's been beautifully digitized at the library. And the story of Joel is really kind of amazing. Um, this person apparently has goiters, if you can look over that. And he's, um, there's a story in the Haggadah that um, il illustrates these pieces. So instead of putting the book, it had initially, it had been, we, the 2000s binding, it had been sewn on alum taught supports then and laced into um, wooden boards, but the book was just too, too delicate for that. So this, this rebinding, it looks like a medieval binding, but it's actually a case binding. Um, because the thought was that if this, um, if we need, if the binding is too, um, you know, is going to uh, damage the paper, the the book, we can the text, we can easily remove the text without having to resew the text. Um, another really great project that I we always come back to, and um, many years later, is the Gantara Scroll um, project from first. Um, and this is a piece that um, possibly uh, was is from the area of Gandhara, which is in northern Pakistan into Afghanistan in the area that my parents' hometown is. And um, working, I, I was involved in the project, but not in terms of doing the treatment. I was the person doing the documentation. And these two conservators, Holly and uh, Mark Bernard, who we got from um, the UK to come, um, is a specialist in this. They worked one day. It was a six-hour treatment from beginning to end. No food, no drink, no bathroom breaks, nothing. They just, there was nothing. They, they had to work on it in one fell swoop. Um, and, and, then, and then we had martinis. <laughs> So, um, so as as I, um, you know, have have at, at some point at the library, I became um, involved in the internship project and became the coordinator for book conservation internship. And um, this was one of the first big projects and. We had uh, an intern, mid-career intern, come from Armenia, Tamara Ohanian, who um, uh, had worked at the Institute of Manuscripts in Armenia and was very adept at treating um, Armenian manuscripts, at rebinding them. So she arrives at the library. We have this book that's been in the library's collection for years. And in 1980s, um, a conservator in the book lab, Jesse Munn, did an assessment of this and the assessment was we need an Armenian speaker to treat this somebody who can read medieval Armenian um, and lo and behold and most of this book um, here was stuck together it was heavily mold damaged all stuck together so Tamara arrives and after six you know six months this is the project we work on together and um the pages were humidified between ethanol and water and taken apart. You can see how um, mold damaged it was. And it was, she mended each sheet with fish skin and um, gelatin and then did a fill with paper, filled the lot area because fish skin is too thin. Um, many pages later, she rebound the manuscript. And um, this is a binding, and it actually works beautifully. Um, so Tamara has since, we, she and I worked together on a lot of Middle Eastern material and a lot of Armenian material. And, um, you know, 
she's my main collaborator on book um book bookmaking in the um middle eastern world that relates to armenian community um i also started going outside and visited um was sent to various places to do training this is turkmenistan um the conservation lab there and these are some of the collections of the library which are very similar to what they have and and it's really interesting in the 19 um with the breakup of the soviet union many collections uh, persian collections in the um central asia came on the market especially in india and um european and american buyers bought them and i think at that point at some, the library acquired many of these books that have counterparts literally the same binder bound them in turkmenistan and in this is in tajikistan where i went to tajikistan and we have very similar um materials so um god i should i am i roll up roll up um so things that um so you know i get to really I really like collaborating. I really like teaching. Um, maybe not so much, but I really like collaborating. And so um, in, 90, in 2017, Sylvia Albro, the great instigator, um, collected a group of us to um, host the um, 35th uh, International Paper Historians Congress at, in Washington, D.C., with um so some of these people are from the national gallery the national archives but the majority were from the library of congress um and uh then of course COVID happened so we had to pivot to a virtual um uh platform anyway from 2017 to now we're still on this the conference happened and this book um is going to be coming out in um the summer, the, the proceedings, the library is going to have it as a PDF on our website, and then a, an actual copy is going to be printed as well. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really amazing what kind of um, relationships one can, and how well one can, how much, how enriching it is to meet the same people every day. I mean, once a week for years and years and years, every day it's it's pretty how much exchange of information and growing one can do this book just came out um and there are i think at least 35 authors i um my collaborator tamara ohanian and i have a, a chapter on armenian manuscripts in this um and and this is just to show that it's while treatment is um, is about you and the object, actually interpretation of the treatment and and um, dissemin you know and and enriching the conservation community actually I think is more a matter of um, exchange of ideas and a discourse with a group of people. Um, so this is these are my um, I'm I've been the head of the paper section for many many. <coughs> years now for about several six seven seven years now um and so i um but i have a couple of projects that i that are on have been on hold and i grad and move through them very very slowly so this is the exodus scroll sheet um it's from um a the middle east it is um one of the oldest complete exodus um, extant sheets. And um, it was at some point um, taken to the Ukraine by a Karite community and given to um, Tsar Nicholas II's uncle when he went to the Crimea to visit the Crimea with his mistress. Who was a ballerina at the uh, Kirov Ballet? So, um, <laughs> um, so these, so you know, at first glance, that everything looks good until you look at the raking light, which really shows you what the condition of the piece is. Um, 
it uh, these 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 um, undulations um, correspond to some of these uh, mends which have to be removed. Um, some of these marks correspond to the um, production of the uh, piece of parchment, the knife, the use, the 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 scraping of the parchment to prepare it for uh, um, writing, and then a lot of the ink is falling out. So one of the things we have to do besides taking off the old repairs is go over each letter with a parchment consolidant or a or a um a gelatin consolidant um we hope to involve everybody in the lab <laughs> this because this is a big piece um another thing i have on my docket and i haven't treated for a long time is to um we have a 240 papyrus fragments from um, a midden in uh, Cairo for start that uh, relate to early Islamic material and um, the early Islamic period, not all early Islamic, and they need to be treated. And so I'm going to train um, a book conservator and a paper conservator so that they can then go on to train um, people in the book lab and people in the paper lab to take on this work and continue with it. These will end up getting, after being mended and flattened and treated, they're going to be um, sandwiched instead of between normal glass, between gorilla glass, which is very, very thin, and then they can be matted and framed. Uh, matted, and they don't need to be framed. So, which is slightly different from how papyrus is usually treated. Usually it's stuck between two fairly heavy pieces of glass and sealed. Um, but this makes for a, a more space efficiency and it's less heavy. Um, so as so those are things I'm looking forward to, but actually for many years I've not done treatment. I, I have the pleasure of working with an amazing group of conservators and I have the, I'm a true dilettante, I tell people what I think. Have you thought about this? What about that? Did you try this? Um, and then, but I never tell them what to do because they're all the experts. And I am, I consider myself a book conservator, right? Um, so here is Gwenan um, Edwards treating uh, some Islamic calligraphy sheets and Heather Wanza treating the, the concept drawing for Captain America, which um, eventually changed, but that was the original concept drawing. Um, and so every day is, um, you know, uh, a complete joy. I mean, I cannot say, I think the libraries, I feel so privileged to work there. And the collections are fantastic, but actually the greatest strength they have is They've got a great team of conservators who all of them is a problem. Everyone's a problem solver and everybody's really, um, they're really good, honest people who don't really have anything to prove. So it's a pleasure to work with them um, and to, you know, yeah. And finally, um, part of the reason why I think I have pivoted from being object focused to people focused is having children and having a family. And there's no way around it. <laughs> you cannot hide in a book. They won't allow it. And um, it's been a, I can't say it's been easy, but I've had to go, you know, um, kicking and screaming into this new environment of being, looking at people and working with people and appreciating them when, um, and it's truly enriched my life. And that is how I've grown with the job. Many thanks to the people who supported the um, William Anthony Conservation Fund and to Giselle and Julie and um, Paul and, and, all, and, and thank you all for being here my friends, my teachers, all of you. It's been a total pleasure.
and these are some um but occasionally when i feel like having fun i do a binding or two usually it's for friends and so this is for holly when she retired and this is for my friend samina who who's pakistani so i decided to use something pakistani anyway thank you